30. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Word of God for the people. Word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. The difficulties that Alice faced were fantasy, and most of us will never be confronted with a Cheshire cat that's uh, spouting riddles with a toothy grin, right? Or a nasty queen of hearts that keeps saying, off with their heads! Well, the wonder of Wonderland is that same aloneness and desolation that many of us saw and felt when the World's Trade Center was attacked and collapsed on 9-11. Could not believe, could not imagine feeling that alone, that desolate. Or more recently, the frightening experiences of children unsafe from a deranged person in a school. Now places like Columbine and the event there and Uvalde, more recently, are not necessarily in our thoughts every day. But in times of tragedy, common tragedy and anguish, we recognize the burden of one land, and we recognize it all too well, because we've seen enough of that in our lifetimes. I look around, there's a little bit more white hair than uh, colors in, in this uh, community right now. So you've lived a long time, and you recognize some of these things. All throughout Alice's adventure, in uh, through the looking glass, she was looking for direction. She was looking for a road to travel. She was looking for the way home. Just like Dorothy in the land of Oz. Remember the wonderful Wizard of Oz? Dorothy wanted to be pointed home. Dorothy lived in the anticipation of rest and of home if we can just get where we're going. I think at times like this, when we have experienced school shootings and COVID and all of the, thing, the events of the past couple of years, comfort and peace can be in short supply, especially when you need it the most. And haven't we needed it the most in the last several years? There's so many experiences of life that cause us to cry out, I just don't understand. What is going on, Lord? One preacher said about this inner need for peace, this, and I copied it down. I want you to listen to it. Strained by the very mad pace of our daily outer burdens, we are further strained by an inward uneasiness because we hints that there is a way of life vastly richer and deeper than all this hurried existence, a life of unhurried serenity and peace and power, if only we could slip over into that center. 
Have you been there? Have you been there with that kind of uneasiness the past couple of years? Past couple of days? Past week or two? Everybody who has sensed that need for serenity. We do need serenity. Everybody that sensed that need for the kind of serenity that seems to be so absent in today's nervous world. Everybody who sensed that has been at that place where rest seems like it will never come again. The most common phrase is, what next? It's as if the burden is all we will ever know. It's all we've ever known. The pressure of life awakens us sometimes in the middle of the night, does it not? Life can be hard. It can be really hard. In our text, we meet Jesus with these wonderful words, come unto me. But what is his context? Where is he? What's he doing? And what are the people around him doing? If you read deeper into this text, you find that Jesus is swimming in a culture of incredible opposition. The pressure had to have been intense. John the Baptist was questioning his own cousin. Are you really the one? Or do we look for somebody else? The crowds were dwindling, kind of like the attendance in the churches in America today. Galilean cities were not responding even to the great miracles that Jesus was doing. And the Pharisees were turning up the heat with political accusations. And in the, mid, in the midst of the heat of battle, we find that Jesus is not only serene, but he, we find that he is filled with a calm and a peace that we'd expect if he was sitting at home in his recliner with the remote in his hand. Jesus was the bedrock of peace amongst a culture in turmoil. And then our text shows up. His invitation. Come unto me. I want to share with you a couple of things that I know happens when you take Jesus up on his invitation. Two things. The first is this. You get rest when the burdens are overwhelming. You get rest when the burdens are overwhelming. In the middle of a world gone mad with the Roman emperors tightening the screws, with local cheating tax collectors, with rampant poverty and disease, and no relief in sight, Jesus turns to the crowd of anxious, haggard, overburdened, and worn out people, and he offers, come unto me, y'all. If you are over, overburdened, if you are absolutely worn out, anxious, haggard, don't know where to turn, come to me, and I will give you rest from your burden. Can anybody say hallelujah to that? Hallelujah. Witness and burdens. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like where we've been living? Life is wonderful, but it does take its toll. It, it can drive you to some pretty severe desperation. How many of you know what Zantax is? It's designed to take the edge off. Why? Because people are on edge. And there's a host of antidepressants, a host of things to help you sleep, help you wake up, help you get through the day. I'm not talking about excesses. I'm talking about desperation. I read about a woman who telephoned a friend. She asked how she was feeling. And the friend said, terrible. She said, my, my head's splitting, my back and my legs are killing me, the house is a mess, the kids are driving me up a wall. 
And very sympathetically, the woman said to him, well, listen, you go lie down. I'll come over right away. I'll cook for you. I'll cook you lunch and get dinner ready for you. I'll clean up the house. I'll take care of the children while you get some rest. By the way, she said, how's Sam? The other woman said, Sam. My husband's name isn't Sam. She said, oh my goodness, I guess I dialed the wrong number. <laughs> and then there was this long pause. And then the meek little voice at the other end of the phone said, but you are coming over, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Does it sound like desperation to you? Even through burdens, life sorrows and hard times, even though these burdens and life sorrows and hard times are part of living, Jesus' offer to us is come. Now that's an invitation to come closer to him, to connect with him, so that the closer we come to Jesus, the less our burdens can press us down. Psalm 68, verse 19 assures us, praise to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Man, if you don't have that psalm tattooed on the inside of your eyelids when you go to sleep, you ought to. It's like the old hymn I learned as a child. Cast your care on Jesus today. Leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. This coming near to Jesus is connecting to his grace. That's vital. Without a vital connection to Jesus, an intimate and personal relationship of fellowship with him, the so-called rest that we claim would be a fraud. We once had a toaster in our house that provided entertainment rather than toast. It had a short, a frayed wire. The sparks were like Disney's life parade, you know, every time you, you try to turn that thing on. Well... Electricity knows when you are not its master, and I certainly am not its master. I have a lot of respect for electricity, but when I tried to fix that toaster, it became like some of our things that don't get professional care at our house. The family calls it a dad-fixed thing. You know, when dad fixes something, whatever dad fixes is sure to come unglued, undone, and the results are unholy. Well, it's like that with the Christian's walk with the master. If you don't have a connection, a good connection, we can become as short-circuited as that toaster that we have. There's no power, no constant power, which lets the machine do what it's designed to do. Short-circuit, no power. A rest becomes a fraud, a fake. And like me with toasters and anything else mechanical or electrical, there's no fixing it without a miracle. But when we come to Christ, truly, offering him our past life, placing the sinful things we have done on the altar, we ask for his power to overcome those temptations in the future. And this is the kind of test that or rest, I should say, that recuperates your whole being and it makes you fit to serve him. This is the rest that Jesus promises, not a life that is free from work. Have you ever decided, I mean, I, I know that many of you are retired, but uh, some of you are still working. Have you ever thought to yourself, well, if I just didn't have to work, life, life would be so sweet. You really don't know what you're talking about. The rest that Jesus promises is not a life free from work or problems, but an oasis when you need it. A rest along the way from the weary burdens that you carry. A time to dial it back. A good, solid connection with Jesus demands that we daily, 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 and sometimes hourly, and sometimes by the minute or second, we put our life in his control by putting aside the love of sin. That is the good connection with Christ. And in the process, our burdens get lifted by the Prince of Calvary. When you come to Jesus, you get rest when the burdens are overwhelming. 
He knows when you need that oasis. A second thing that takes place is that your life gets balanced. I want to reread what Bud read a moment ago, the last two verses of our text, Matthew 11, 29 and 30. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Did you ever understand that the rest <coughs> of your soul is the balance? He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now, you probably have heard this in sermons a hundred times. I don't <coughs> need to repeat it to refer to it. The yoke has two sides to it. One for the strongest lead animal and the other for the one that's supposed to follow and learn. That's what Jesus is talking about. Balance is a matter of knowing and living by the right priorities. It's not trying to be in the side of the yoke. Because you're a Christian and you understand this principle that there is a yoke and Jesus occupies one side and you occupy the other side. And the side that he operates or is in, the side that Jesus is in, is the one that requires the most strength. And it's the yoke side of leading. The animal that knows which way to go is the one that leads. The stronger animal gets in that side of the yoke. The weaker animal gets in the other side because it's lighter. And you can learn from the other animal. Now, farmers have known this for as long as farming has been done and animals have been used for farming. A yoke is for learning as well as doing. <coughs> Balance is a matter of knowing and living by the right priorities. You don't get on Jesus' side to lead you get in the followers or the disciples' side to follow. For the believer in Jesus Christ, there's only one balanced priority, and that's this. Whatever Jesus wants is what I want. Whatever Jesus wants is what I want. That's when your life gets balanced. Jesus says, take his yoke. He doesn't say, pick up a yoke. He doesn't say get in anybody else's yoke. He said pick up his yoke. My yoke, he said, is easy, light, unburdened. And we learn by following in his footsteps. We are in the disciple seat. We are together, but he leads. There's at least some apocryphal evidence that Jesus, the carpenter, 2,000 years ago made some of the best yokes in Galilee. Did you know that that's what carpenters did in those days? He made yokes. Jesus knew what he was talking about. He knew how to design a yoke that would be just right for an animal, physically. But when he uses this as an illustration, he's talking about us. He's talking about the shepherd and the sheep. The shepherd goes in the strong part, the heavy part, the burden-bearing part. The sheep go in the learning part, the lighter part part where we can learn and follow, not lead. The good yoke is light, and it doesn't chafe while you work. It's balanced, so the major load of the work is borne by the lead person or the lead animal. Jesus' footsteps were balanced. You want some evidence of that? Think about these things. There were times in Jesus' life of intense prayer, or weren't there times to laugh when the children came to him. There were times in Jesus' life that were times to heal, but they were balanced by times to swing the whip in the temple, to throw the tables over in the temple. There was a time to eat, and with Jesus there was a time to fast for 40 days. That is balance. That is also the balance that a Christian warrior needs. Taking his yoke means joining with Jesus. It also means understanding that in his yoke, he is the leader. We are to serve every day, giving ourselves to Jesus, allowing him to take control of our life and our burdens. 
We serve, we put ourselves in the yoke, a place where he bears the leader's weight, but we bear the weight of learning how the leader leads so that we can lead others. So what do we do with all of this? What do we do about that? How do we live our lives so that it'll be balanced, so that we get rest when the burdens grow overbearing? How shall we apply this understanding that coming, coming close to Jesus means having our burden lifted and that coming close to Jesus means balanced lives? I would say that the conclusion to that is that we have to spend our lives coming close every day, every second, coming close and connecting with Jesus. We have to take the time to develop putting on that gentle yoke and accepting the leadership of the master. I think today, many of us might feel like Alice having fallen through the looking glass. For those of you that are more than 50 years of age, did you ever think that you would live to see the day and fill in the blank, right? When we muddled deep in trials and temptations on every hand, when you got a bill that's larger than your income, you got a relationship that just isn't working, just doesn't seem it can work. You got some mountain to climb that just seems like it's never going to end, you're never going to get there. Whatever frenzy the world throws at you, here's what Jesus is saying to us when he says his yoke is easy, his burden is light. He said, when you come close, you are going to find out, just like the songwriter put it, there is rest along the weary way. When you arise from that rest and you return back into the battle, you will be ready because you will have discovered that following in his yoke, learning of his ways, not only provides rest when you need it, but it balances your life to the point where you know that there's a victory coming. There's rest along the weary way. You're the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you would take your hand notes, please, and turn to page 13. You want to share that great supper that God's church has shared for centuries and centuries now. And if you haven't gotten the cup, this would be a good time to do so. Peel it back, and the juice is revealed, and the bread as well. Responses are on page 13. Let's share together this great thanksgiving, thanksgiving for the day of Pentecost. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning, your spirit moved over the face of the waters. You formed in us, you formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. Your spirit came upon prophets and teachers, anointing them to speak your word. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, 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 God, God power and body, heaven and earth, earth and the glory of your glory, and the sight of your eyes, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. At his baptism in the Jordan, your spirit descended upon him and declared him your beloved Son. With your spirit upon him, he turned away the temptations of sin. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, he 
You gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord ascended, he promised to be with us always, baptizing us with the Holy Spirit and with fire as on the day of Pentecost. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and gave thanks to you. And then he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you and he gave it to his disciples and he said to them, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood in the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day he raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and sharing of the cup. And so in mighty in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ, Christ will come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood and empowered by the gifts of the Spirit. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the entire world, showing forth the fruit of the Spirit until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father God, now and forever. Amen. The hymn that we sing, 389, is Freely, Freely. Freely you have received so freely go out and share. That's a pretty straightforward invitation. Beyond, come unto me, and I will give you rest, and I will give you balance, and I will give you an oasis for <coughs> the burden of the day. Beyond that is another invitation to turn and go. Go, you who have freely received and freely given. Let's stand together as we sing. <laughs>
can't do this with your eyes closed. You've got to look at the flame that is being held before you. And understand that on the day of Pentecost, a flame like that rested on all the disciples. Why? They were confused. They didn't have a clue where things were going. They didn't know what they should do. But the Holy Spirit came down like tongues of flame. The Holy Spirit rested on each one of those. I would say to you as a blessing, as a commissioning, go from this place with your burdens lifted and your soul rested. Go from this place with your shoulder well fitted to the master's yoke, which is gentle and powerful. Go from this place to bless and serve others freely in his name.